Well, three weeks ago, we started a sermon series that we're calling Captive. And for the past few weeks, we have been learning about an interesting Greek word. And that word is akmalatos. Now, this is a really fascinating word because it's actually a combination of two words. Akme, which means a spear, and halotos, which means to be captured. So when you put these two words together, you get akmalatos, which means one who's taken by the spear. And it means that I have used this spear to take you captive as my prisoner. And so you don't control me, I control you. And the fascinating thing is that we're not talking about a hostage situation or like an ancient bank robbery. No, the Bible uses this word to describe how we should view our thoughts. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 10.5. It says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So the first part of this verse is saying that us as Christians, we don't escalate drama. We don't do drama. We squash it. And the second half of Scripture tells us that when it comes to our thoughts, there's only two options. Either I control you or you control me. And all of us know how true that is when it comes to what we think. Because it's so easy to let our thoughts and emotions sit in the driver's seat of our lives. Because over the past few weeks, we've talked about how easy it is to let jealousy consume our mind. Or how quickly anger can take over, making us do things that we never thought that we would. And last week, we learned about how destructive even one thought can be. Well, today, we're going to talk about another way that our thoughts have a tendency to control us. And that is through an incredibly powerful process called assumptions. And this is such an important topic because... If we're not careful, assumptions have the ability to alter the way we view people, see the world, and even how we think about certain areas of our lives. In fact, I read an interesting article this week by a psychologist named Dr. Marcia Sirota that talks about the power assumptions can have on us mentally. This is what she says. It's so easy to think that we know what's going on in someone else's head. It's not hard for us to imagine that we understand why a person has taken a particular course of action. But we don't really know why. We make a guess based on our imagination or past experiences or wishful thinking. And then she wrote, the problem with making these types of assumptions, and we all do it, is that more often than not, we're wrong. We assume that a person has a specific motivation for their actions or that an event took place for a specific reason. Then we start to see these incorrect assumptions as the truth. And most of us would agree with that because there have been times where a lot of us have made assumptions that were way off base. Like if we see a message on a significant other's phone that's from a man or a woman that we don't know. We can assume it's someone from work talking about a project, and if that's the case, then it's not really a big deal. Or we can assume the worst. And if we convince ourselves that there's something going on, then our thoughts are off to the races. Well, why is that person texting them? How do they know them? How long have they been friends? What are they talking about? Are are they secretly spending time together? Oh, I hope they're not cheating, because if they are, what would my family think? Everything would be ruined. And because of one incorrect assumption, we're already in a lawyer's office in our minds. Well, today we're going to look at a story in Scripture that shows us just how powerful our assumptions can be. But in order for these verses to make sense, I have to give you a little bit of background information. Because over the past few weeks, we've been walking through a few stories in the life of a man named David. And now David went from being a shepherd boy to one of the greatest military leaders of all time. But his life was not easy because King Saul hated him. Saul was jealous of how much the Hebrew people loved David. And so he made it his mission to make David's life miserable. But eventually Saul died. And then David at that point became the king over all of Israel. And the first order of business as king was to go get something called the Ark of the Covenant, also known as the Ark of God. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was a really big deal to ancient Israel. 
See, it was essentially a really fancy box that was carried by priests on long poles, and it held objects that represented important events in Israel's history. Now, some of you might be familiar with the Ark of the Covenant because Indiana Jones went looking for it in his first movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I want you to see how they describe it. Watch this. The Lost Ark. Yeah, the Ark of the Covenant, the chest the Hebrews used to carry around the Ten Commandments. What do you what mean, do you mean the, Commandments? You're talking about the Ten Commandments? Yes, the actual Ten Commandments, the original stone tablets that Moses brought down out of Mount Harab and smashed, if you believe in that sort of thing. Now, what does this Ark look like? Uh, there's a picture of it right here. That's it. God. Yes, that's just what the Hebrews thought. Uh, now what's that supposed to be coming out of there? Lightning. Fire. Power of God or something. You're to understand Hitler's interest in this. Thing. Oh, yes. The Bible speaks of the Ark leveling mountains and laying waste to entire regions. An army which carries the Ark before it is invincible. So it's pretty obvious why when David set up the city of Jerusalem as his capital city, the first thing he wanted to do was to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the city. So with that in mind, look at what the Bible says in 2 Samuel 6.12. So David went to bring up the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the Ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, and now I want to stop right there for just a second. An ephod is a type of clothing that was typically worn by priests at this time in history. And we aren't completely sure what it looks like because this was about 3,000 years ago, but scholars suggest that it would look something like a Greek chiton, which is a white robe that was clasped at the shoulders and went down to about the mid-thigh and it was tied with a belt. Now, if you know anything about robes, you know that if you do anything other than just walking, then some extra skin might show. And that's going to come into play later in the story. But let's look back at what it says next. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. So Scripture says that David didn't just take a couple people and go and get the ark quietly and bring it back into town. No, He brought it to town in style. The Bible says that there was this huge processional that where basically the whole country showed up and there was singing and dancing and with King David leading the charge wearing an ephod. And so think of this like the parade when the Cavs won the finals. Do you guys remember that day? I mean, the streets were packed and it was loud and everyone was yelling and jumping around and dancing. And that is exactly what is happening in this story. This was a huge celebration for the Hebrew people because the ark of the Lord or ark of God was coming into town. So everyone in town is partying hard. But there's one person who didn't show up because they were not very happy with what was happening. Look at what it says next in verse 16. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Now, if you remember from a few weeks ago, we learned something about Michael. Look at what it says in 1 Samuel 18. Now, Saul's daughter Michael was in love with David. And when they told Saul about it, he was pleased. So Michael is the daughter of the previous king, and she's also in love with David. And when she found out that her dad was okay with it, Michael and David got married. But she is not participating in the party that day. See, she didn't even leave the house. She's just standing in a window watching. And I don't want you to miss what it said here because the Bible, every word in the Bible is important. And the scripture did not say that when she saw David that she got upset or she got angry. No, scripture says that she despised him in her heart. 
So what changed? How did Michael go from being completely in love with David to despising him in her heart? Because she had no idea what was actually happening down there, just what she could see from her window. But I want you to notice that when when she looked down and saw her husband, she let her thoughts take her captive. And Michael made an assumption. After one glance, one look, she thought that she had the whole picture. And the, the sad thing is, her assumption was totally wrong. But remember, the party is still going on and David has no idea what's running through his wife's head. Look at what he does next in verse 17. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. So the parade stops at the tabernacle where the ark is going to stay. And then David takes the festivities to the next level by giving everyone something to eat. And who doesn't love a party with free food? But see, eventually the blowout ends and everyone heads home. But David has no idea that his wife had made the worst assumption possible. Look what happens as soon as he steps into his front lawn. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants like any vulgar fellow would! Exclamation point. Now, it would be tough to find any other verse in Scripture that is dripping with as much sarcasm as this one. See, David comes home from this huge day, adrenaline still flowing, and he comes walking back to his palace, and his wife meets him in the front yard and pulls out the verbal pistols and starts shooting. And the reason this verse ends with an exclamation point is because this was loud. I mean, the stage was set for an all-out front yard screaming match. And see, there was no, hi, honey, how was your day? Or even, hey, you look really hot in that ephod, babe. Now, see, it went straight into... Wow, you really outdid yourself today. You just, you're just you so amazing strutting your stuff for the whole world to see like any other disgusting man would. And see, David must have been caught completely off guard because and he had no idea what his wife was thinking. See, David saw this day as a day to celebrate what the Lord had done for Israel. But Michael didn't see it that way. See, Michael saw what David was doing and she assumed the worst. She thought, what is he wearing? Where is royal robes? I mean, I thought he was supposed to be a noble ruler. I bet all those women are just drooling over him. How can my husband act like this? What would my dad think if he saw a king acting like this? And see, she had the whole day to let her anger build and her thoughts run wild. So as soon as David steps onto the property, Michael is there to meet him. And she had a few options as to how she could have handled this. She, she could have just told him what she was feeling and how it looked from her perspective by saying, hey, I know today was a big day and you were so happy to be bringing the ark home. But when you dance in front of everyone like that, it makes me feel really insecure because I know how all the women look at you. So it would mean a lot if you would think about this before you acted that way. But see, that's not what she did. Instead, she immediately went on the attack before David could even get into the front door. And we've all been there. We've assumed things about people that we date or our spouse or our friends or our parents. And what happens to us emotionally? Our emotions and our thoughts, they build and build and build until we explode with anger. And we point our finger and the veins bulge out on our necks. And we assume negative, untrue things about people that we love when we know that they would never do that. See, maybe you're in high school and you were sitting next to someone and your boyfriend or girlfriend just assumed that that you were sitting there to flirt with someone new. Or maybe one of your coworkers complimented your boss and you assumed that they were just sucking up to them to get that promotion that you wanted. And our emotions build and build until there's a confrontation. 
And it gets really tense really quickly. And that's what's happening in this story. Michael sees her husband, makes an assumption, and fires the first shots. And the funny thing is, her assumption is totally wrong. David didn't even do anything. But I want you to see how he responds in verse 21. David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I'll become even more undignified than this. I'll be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls that you speak of, I'll be held in honor. So when David gets this assumption thrown into his face, he does not keep his cool. Even though Michael totally misinterpreted what David did, he did not take a deep breath and diffuse the situation by saying, I think you misread things. Can we talk about this? Now, see, he immediately escalates the situation by responding out of anger and taking a shot back. And see, he didn't just defend himself either. No, he went on the offensive and he brought Michael's family into the argument. Even though Michael was totally focused on actions that same day, David digs up old wounds by saying, wait a minute, I was worshiping God. Yeah, remember that God that said that your dad wasn't good enough? And then when he died, instead of choosing one of your brothers, he chose me? Yeah, at least I'm not like them. And the conversation jumps from dance moves and clothing choices to insulting Michael's family. And maybe you know what this is like. Maybe you're in a fight with your spouse and about something small, like how one of you isn't picking up after yourselves, you aren't carrying your weight with the household chores. And then all of a sudden, the conversation jumps from picking up socks and underwear to something about her mom, his dad, at least I'm better than fill in the blank. We respond not to just win the argument, but we try to hurt the other person. And that's exactly what's happening. And the funny thing is, this is where the story ends. There's no resolution, nothing. All it says is, and Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Which means that apparently these two never made up. Because of Michael's one assumption about clothing and David's bad temper, their relationship was done. Something so small destroyed their marriage. Which makes me think, how different could this story have been if Michael had assumed the best? Or what would have happened if David hadn't lost his temper? Or what if they both just did the right thing and apologized instead of holding on to their bitterness and anger? I think their relationship would have looked a whole lot different. And if we're honest, I think that some of our relationships would look differently too. Because most of us would admit that it's so easy to let our assumptions take us captive. It's so easy to make snap judgments or jump to conclusions. And the reality is, our assessments may not be true at all. So what do we do? Since we live in a culture where it's so common to make unfair assumptions, what do we do? Does the Bible have any insight into a topic like this? Well, interestingly enough, the Bible gives us some great direction on how to overcome the thought process of making unfair assumptions. And the first clue is actually hidden in a verse that we learned last week. Look what the Bible says in Philippians 4.8. Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You see, Scripture tells us that if we focus our thoughts on things that are right, true, noble, excellent, it becomes really difficult to make unfair assumptions. Because if I'm thinking things about her that are right, that means I'm not thinking anything wrong or derogatory. And if I'm thinking excellent things about him, that means I'm not making a negative assumption because excellence and negativity don't go together. They're contradicting thoughts. So when we learn to ask our que ourselves questions like, wait a second, is this right? Is this true, admirable, praiseworthy? Then our assumptions go from negative to positive. So the first thing we have to do is we need to start thinking differently. 
Because when we think differently, then our assumptions change. And the second thing you learn from this story is that when we confront someone about an assumption that they made about us, the way we respond means everything. Our volume, our tone, and word choice matter. Because as we all know, it's not just what you say that matters, but how you say it. And this situation would have been completely different if David did not respond out of anger. If he would have just paid attention to the words he was saying to his wife, this story would have ended really differently. But the third lesson that we learn is that when we allow our mind to make unfair assumptions about people, we're hurting them more than we could even realize. Because when we put labels on people, when we say things like, well, they're just fake or they're just so selfish, that's not just unfair, but it's also hurting them more than we know. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 18, 14, the human spirit can endure a sick body, but who can bear a crushed spirit? See, what it's saying is that our bodies are able to get through physical pain. We can recover from injuries and illness. But if someone says something about us that just destroys us emotionally, that's a totally different story. See, emotional pain does not go away nearly as fast as physical pain. And when we make assumptions about people, we have to remember that thoughts lead to action and actions lead to results. And so when we allow our mind to make a negative assumption about someone, the action that comes from that is judging them. And the result of that is that we end up hurting them more than we ever intended. And once that damage is done, it's really hard to undo it. That's why the Bible says in verse 19 of that same chapter, an offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. So the question I want to leave you with today is this. Do you assume the best? When it comes to your family, your friends, the people that you work with, do you assume the best or do you assume the worst? And what about when it comes to God? Do you honestly assume that he loves you and he wants to help you? Or do you assume that he hates you because of the things that you've done? And maybe you've been coming here for a few months or even a couple years and you've heard over and over again that God is not mad at you. That he loves you so much that he let his son be killed to restore his relationship with you. But when we allow our assumptions to take us captive, we convince ourselves that the thoughts that are racing through our mind are the truth. And so what if we took control back? And what if we started to assume the best? How different would our relationships be if we started to assume the best, both with the people around us and with God? Let's pray. God, I know that this is a, this is a difficult topic for me to preach on because it's something that I struggle with too. And I think that, that everyone in this room does because all of us make assumptions every single day, whether right or wrong, big or small. But we've seen it happen in our own lives, what happens when we let our assumptions take us captive. And we've said things and done things and thought things that we wish we could take back. And relationships are different now and they can't go back to how they were. And so God, I just pray that you give us the opportunity this week to just put this into practice, to take one step and say, okay, this week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check my thoughts. I'm going to say, wait a second. Is that true? Is that right? Is that fair of me to, to think that about them? And if not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it right there. I'm going to catch that. And I'm going to assume the best. Maybe it's not the best. I'm going to assume the best for right now. Until I can talk to them and find out more information, I'm going to assume the best. And God, I think that if we were able to do this, that every one of our relationships would look radically different. And so we just need your help. And it'd be great if we could do this for the rest of our lives. But for this week, will you just give us extra help to figure out how to take our assumptions captive? God, we love you so much. And we thank you for what you did through your son on the cross. And we could never thank you enough for that. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.